Before the 1970s, the American Psychiatric Association categorized homosexuality as a mental illness. Honestly, it kind of makes sense why they would believe this, as the homosexual patients they saw, the test subjects, further theories and studies, were in fact unhappy homosexuals. Those who were depressed, those who struggled socially and mentally with their sexuality, and those who simply did not want to be gay and seeked out medical advice to change. The happy homosexuals, on the other hand, had no reason to seek out psychiatric help, and therefore, the APA sample was skewed. So it was up to those happy homosexuals to change the mind of the APA, and our story begins in 1970 at the APA convention in San Francisco. Let's head over there. I'm Lisa Sarrington, and welcome to Everyone's Gay, a look at a queer history. the American Psychiatric Association, or the APA, held its annual conference in San Francisco, a gay hub. So naturally, activists in San Francisco saw the opportunity for change. From the first moment of the conference, members of the APA were met with activists, demanding that their voices be heard. Outside the convention center, activists formed a human chain, while inside, some greeted psychiatrist Irving Bieber, who was best known for his study in which he took the position that homosexuality is an illness. They proved to be so disruptive that the convention organizers decided that in order to avoid con another convention of protests, that they would invite gay rights activists to speak on a panel focused on homosexuality at the next convention in Washington, D.C. This panel asked that homosexuality be removed from the DSM and try to explain the stigma caused by the diagnosis that homosexuality was a mental illness. Entitled Psychiatry, A Friend or Foe to the Homosexual, a Dialogue, it included Frank Kamney, who we saw in one of our last episodes, and Barbara Giddings on the panel. As Barbara Giddings later noted, the panel had homosexuals and psychiatrists, but it did not have a speaker who was both. So Giddings set out to find one who would be willing to be a panel member. After numerous contacts, she was unable to find a gay psychiatrist who would speak. So she decided that she would read letters from gay psychiatrists without revealing their names. She then got in contact with Dr. John E. Fryer and was able to convince him to appear. Fryer later stated that the only reason he agreed was because Giddings suggested that he could do it in a disguise. Listed only as Dr. H. Anonymous, Fryer appeared on stage wearing a rubber joke shop face mask, a wig, and a baggy tuxedo, and spoke through a microphone that distorted his voice. Fryer's speech began with, I am a homosexual. I am a psychiatrist. He went on to describe the lives of many gay psychiatrists in the APA who had to hide their sexuality from their colleagues for fear of discrimination, and had to hide their profession from fellow homosexuals because of the disdain in which the psychiatric profession was held among the gay community. Here to talk more on this is Professor Bob Connolly. You may remember him from our past episode on the annual reminders. Take it away, Professor. He basically told the audience from behind a mask, you know, there are hundreds of us here, and we have our own little meetings within the APA convention, and we call it the Gay PA. <laughs> and all season, we've been talking about you know, the homophile movement versus the gay liberation movement, where the homophile movement was centered in this idea of normalcy with the Mashing Society and the Daughters of Belitis, and then the gay liberation, which started with the Stonewall Uprisings and all the activism that came after. Where does the APA fit in this? Because it's right in that transitional period. So the homophiles 
Um, and the modern gay liberationists, as they were called post Stonewall, existed side by side for a while. And, um, and it really was the homophiles who, in my opinion, were responsible for the American Psychiatric Association mm-hmm. taking homosexuality off of its list of mental illnesses in 1973. There was some militant activism going on around that issue at the time. There were what were called zaps, where uh, gay men and lesbians in the early 70s would uh, infiltrate, for example, uh, a lecture hall where a psychiatrist would be speaking on the mental illness of homosexuality, and uh, they would rush the stage and grab the microphone out of the psychiatrist's hand and... and, um, you know, talk about how this way of thinking is outmoded and gay people are just like straight people. Um, so there was, there was a militant, militant aspect of fighting um, for recognition of not being uh, uh, mentally ill, but it was people like Frank Kameny, Jack Nichols, Barbara Giddings, who was uh, prominent in the Daughters of Belitis, Um, Lily Vincennes, who went to the American Psychiatric Association's annual conferences in 1970, 71, 72, 73, to um, host um, panels that discussed homosexuality um, as as not a mental illness. You had a little bit of both occurring at the same time, but I think the APA responded um, more favorably to the homophiles than they would kind of the militant kids in the street, as it were. Right. So, although it was the um, the homophiles who who got the APA to change their position, it was the activists that brought it to their attention in a way that could not be dismissed. So. So, yeah, so they they both really did have something to do with that. Thank you, Professor. Many people agreed with Fryer, Kamney, and Giddings that the stance of the psychiatric establishment towards homosexuality was wrong. The APA's vice president at the time, Dr. Judd Marmer, said, I must concede that psychiatry is prejudiced, as has been charged. Psychiatric mores reflect the predominant social mores of the culture. He later added on, in a democratic society, we recognize the rights of such individuals to have widely divergent religious preferences, as long as they do not attempt to force their beliefs on others who do not share them. Our attitudes towards divergent sexual preferences, however, are quite different. Obviously because moral values, crouched in medical and scientific rationalizations are involved. Homosexuality was removed from the DSM in 1973, a year after Fryer's speech. As newspapers reported, homosexuals had gained the instant cure. Fryer's speech had been cited as a key factor in persuading the psychiatric community to reach the decision. And Barbara Giddings later said, his speech shook up psychiatry. He was the right person at the right time. Fryer himself later wrote about his experiences in 1985 in a newsletter of the Association of Gay and Lesbian Psychiatrists. He wrote that it was something that had to be done. And the central event in my career, I had been thrown out of residency because I was gay. I lost a job because I was gay. It had to be said, but I couldn't do it as me. I was not yet full time on the Temple faculty. I'm now tenured and tenured by a chairman who knows I'm gay. That's how things have changed. Fryer was officially recognized as Dr. H. Anonymous at the 1994 APA convention. Fryer died a couple years later in 2003, and in his honor, the APA now grants the Fryer Award to individuals who significantly contribute to improving the health of sexual minorities. Although the award doesn't specify if these individuals need to do it whilst wearing a distorted mask. To learn more about Dr. H. Anonymous, check out the play 
217 boxes of Dr. Henry Anonymous, which provides a portrait of John Fryer from the perspective of three key figures in his life. And read the journal article, Unmasking Dr. Anonymous, in the John Fryer papers. It is linked below. I'm Alexis Arrington, and this has been Everyone's Gay, A Look Into Queer History. If you like this episode, make sure to hit like, subscribe, and share it with your friends. Also, find us on social media at Everyone's Gay Queer History. We're on both Facebook and Instagram. Make sure to follow these accounts because we have a couple of really big announcements coming very soon, and they'll be plastered all over social media. I want to give a special thank you to Professor Connolly for coming to join us again. We really appreciate him sharing his knowledge with us. In addition, if you go to American University, make sure to look him up and take one of his spectacular classes. I highly recommend them. Again, I'm Melissa Serrington, and this has been Everyone's Gay, A Look in a Queer History. I'll see you next time.